take your Bibles and go back to Luke chapter 12. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12. And uh, this morning, because my computer decided to upgrade its operating system this morning, I couldn't print in time. So I'm just going to have to get my laptop up here. Hope that's not too distracting for you guys. All right, guys, Luke chapter 12, look at verse 21. Luke chapter 12, 21. It says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. The title of the sermon this morning is Rich Toward God. Hey, we want to be people that are rich toward God. Hey, you, you, you might be blessed in the way of having riches on this earth. There's nothing wrong with having riches on this earth. But more often than not, the people of God aren't the richest people on the earth. Okay, Because it's like God knows that the riches and the treasures of this world are going to distract us from his kingdom. Okay, But more important than our riches on this earth is to have our riches in heaven. So God can look at us, regardless of how much money you make per year, regardless of how many possessions you have, that when God looks at us, he sees, this is a rich person in my sight. This person has great treasures in heaven. And so that's what we want to be focusing on. From this chapter, there's a lot in this chapter, but that's what I want to take out as the primary thought. Look at verse number 1, Luke chapter 12, verse 1. And in the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, I mean, there were, there were so many people following the Lord right now, seeking to see what He has to say and the works He's doing. The Bible says it's innumerable. There is that, there is that many. We're just not going to give a number, okay? And then it says, in so much they trod one upon another, literally stepping on each other's feet as they went to hear Christ. He began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. All right? So first thing I want you to, you know, as we've gone through the book of Luke, you've come to realize that the, the multitudes that are there listening to Jesus aren't always his believers. They're not, they aren't always his disciples, are they? Sometimes they're unbelievers. Sometimes they're complete reprobates, those that have blasphemed the Holy Ghost. Sometimes it's the Pharisees seeking to find fault in the, in the things that Jesus would say and do. Okay, This is important for you just always, as you go through the Gospels, always remind yourselves when we, Jesus is preaching to the multitudes, he's preaching to a, 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 to a variety of people, different groups. They're not always saved. Okay, You, you need to maintain that because this is one chapter that if you don't have that in mind, you're going to get confused on some of the passages. Okay, You'll even get to a point, and we've seen a, a pastor in the United States, get to a point where he thinks even believers can go to the lake of fire for a short period of time. Okay, And this is one of these chapters where if you don't keep that in mind, that Jesus preached to many groups, you'll come to false doctrine, you'll come to a false understanding of what Jesus says. But notice he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Watch leaven. It's like yeast. It's something that causes the bread to grow. It's something that spreads. It's like a, like a bacteria. And he says, beware of that of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. He says, look, the, the Pharisees are hypocrites. We already know this, right? We know the Pharisees quite well by now. That on the outside, they, they love the outside. They love to look clean. They love to, be, to wash their hands before eating. But inwardly, they are filthy. Inwardly, they are lost. Inwardly, many of them were reprobate. Okay? And so they are hypocrites. And what you find is, you know, the re many religions in this world, many religious leaders in this world are hypocrites. They've taken the leaven of the Pharisees, which is, hey, look how godly, you know, look at us and how righteous we are, but yet they are still lost. They are still yet dead in their sins and their trespasses. Verse number two. And uh, verse number two follows on with this thought, okay? For, so that's a conjunction there, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear of in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. So as you read verses 2 and 3, it's, it's important for you to realize verse number 1. What's he talking about? The leaven of the Pharisees, the hypocrisy. Okay, And what Jesus is teaching here is that at some point, whether on this earth, or whether it's the judgment of, of God and the, the great white throne judgment, 
that these hypocritical religious leaders that are lost, these hypocritical religious leaders that are sending people to hell, they're going to be exposed. At some point, look, even these Pentecostal charlatans, you know, that you see, the TV evangelists, many of them have been exposed, you know, for being money hungry. Many of them have been exposed that their, their so-called miracles were, were all, you know, falsified. You know, the information that they received so-called from the Holy Ghost was a sham. Hey, many people get exposed in this life. But there's going to be others that will be exposed at the great white throne judgment, okay? So this is what it's teaching about. Hey, you want to be a hypocritical religious leader, okay? You know, appearing to be righteous on the outside, hey, it's, it's, it's going to come out. You know, don't worry about it. You know, if you've been fooled by some pastors, some preachers in the past, okay, don't worry, it's going to be exposed. God will make sure that they're going to be exposed for the hypocrites that they are. Verse number four. And I say unto you, now look at this. So he was talking about the, the Pharisees there, he was talking about the lost, but when you get to verse number four, look what he says. And I say unto you, my friends. Okay, so now is he, is he talking to the lost? No, now he's talking to the believers. Okay, now he's talking to his friends. He says, be not afraid of them that kill the body. You know, obviously the, 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 the Pharisees there, but also just other people that can hurt you. And after that, um, sorry, and after that have no more that they can do. So look, if someone kills you, I mean, look, What's the worst thing you can think of, like, in life? It's, it's probably death. It's not like, you know, being killed, being murdered. That's probably one of the worst things you can think about happening. But God says, look, don't be afraid of them that kill the body, but because there's nothing more they can do to you after that. Okay, it's like death for Jesus. Is like you're just passing through to eternity. You know, you're just going to, you know, you're just going to have that eternal life that you already have, but you're going to be living that out without that sinful body. You know, Christ is not overly concerned about the death of his saints. Okay, and, and we shouldn't be that way either. You know, we shouldn't be overly concerned about people that can destroy this body, knowing full well that we're going to be in the presence of the Lord forever. Okay, but verse number five, but I will for, forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he have killed have power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now he's talking to his believers here. He's not saying that God will cast you into hell, but that he has the power to cast people into hell. That's the person that we ought to fear. The one that has not just power on this earth, but power in the afterlife, okay? And notice that it says here that God casts people into hell. You know, I, I've, I've heard preaching, you know, I've heard pastors that try to sugarcoat the Bible. And it's like, you know, no, God is so loving. You know, God, God is full of love. He would never send anyone to hell. He never casts anyone into hell, they say. So you cast yourself into hell. You know, you're the one that does it. You end up throwing yourself into hell and God didn't, you know, I was trying to stop you from doing that. Look, no, if you reject Jesus Christ, you reject the free gift of salvation, God will take you and cast you into hell. Okay, that's the other side of God that we need to know, his righteous anger and his righteous judgment that comes. But look, Knowing that God is that way as well, that should bring fear into us. If we fear the Lord in a righteous biblical manner, it's going to cause us to want to please Him. You know, it's going to want it's, it, to, to, to be with Him. Hey, if I'm going to be aligned with anybody on this earth, it's going to be with God, right? Because I know God can do anything, that God can answer my prayers, my needs that I have. I want to be with you, God. I want to be lined up with you. I want to be walking with you. And that should come out of fear, you know? Uh, the, what does the Bible say? That the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is the beginning of knowledge. Okay? You know, just, just being a wise person, understanding the, the things of God, the first thing you need to do is fear Him. I mean, the fact that you're even saved means there was a point where you feared God, what He could do to you, you know, if you, if you, if you went into eternity without being made right with God. Okay? So it's important for us, guys, you know, if you have a fear of man, you have a fear of government, you have a fear of someone that can hurt you, look, just to overcome that, you need to make sure you have a fear of God and that's going to outweigh what the fear of man and, and what they can do to you, okay? Verse number six. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? So I'm not sure what two farthings is, but I, that, I'm assuming that's like a, a very cheap price. And, and then it says, and not one of them is forgotten before God. So it says, look, even little sparrows, little birds, they're, they're, they're you know, they're not, they're cheap, they're not worth much in the eyes of men. You know, you just purchase five for two farthings. 
but not one of those are forgotten before God. Look, God knows every little creature. God knows everything of his creation. And even more amazing than remembering the little sparrows. And by the way, what he's saying there, look, if if God's going to remember the little sparrow, you're so much more valuable to him. As a child of God, you know, you might come to a point where you think, God, aren't you hearing my prayers? Don't you know my needs? Of course he does, okay? Because he knows the needs of the little sparrow, all right? And so much more than that he uh, cares for you. Verse number seven. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, that, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows, okay? God not only knows how many hairs you've got, but it says even the, the hairs of your head are all numbered, like, if, that means if I'm, like, that one I'm grabbing there, I don't know if I'm grabbing one or many, I have no idea, but God knows that number, right? God knows that's number, you know, I don't know how many hairs I go through, uh, 2 billion, you know, 320. God knows that number of that hair on my head, okay? So if he knows that about me, then of course he's going to be there uh, and, and uh, fulfill the needs that I have as long as I'm, I'm seeking first his kingdom, we'll, see, we'll soon, soon see that, okay? Verse number eight. And look at this. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. So this is a heavenly blessing, a heavenly acknowledgement from Jesus to believers who openly confess Jesus Christ. You know, if you just openly confess that I'm saved in Christ to your family and friends, or you go out there and you go and give the gospel and you say, look, Jesus is my Savior. He can be your Savior too. You openly confess Him in this life, then Jesus Christ will confess you. You know, He will speak highly of you in heaven to the angels. It's a, it's a great honor that God wants to give us, as, you know, should we confess Him uh, before the angels. Now, verse number 9 um, It's a little tricky, but I I believe verse number 9 is about the unsaved, okay? I believe it's about the unsaved. Uh, But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. I've heard some preaching um, where this is basically, you know, if you're just a believer that doesn't, uh, you know, acknowledge God, then God's kind of going to deny you, deny you rewards. And and, look, that could be an interpretation. I think that's, that's fine as well. But I think, when you think of the word denying me here, I believe this is talking about rejecting the Lord. And remember, because of the multitude, because they were saved and unsaved in this group, what I think he's saying here is that those that deny me or reject me, then Jesus Christ will reject them uh, before the angels of God. So, um, and I think it, it's uh, verse number 10 makes me believe that about verse number 9 a little bit more. Because look at verse number 10. It says, and whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. So Jesus um, gives us two groups of people. You know, you, you may have gone through life where you've spoken, you know, against Christ or you rejected Christ. But you know, if you just come before him in faith and receive him as your Savior, that too will be forgiven. Okay, so that, that's one group of people, the, the, the saved that might have been rejecting Christ through different periods of their life, but eventually got saved. And then you have another group of people that blaspheme against the Holy Ghost, and it says that they shall not be forgiven. Okay, and again, what's blaspheming against the Holy Ghost? It's basically saying that Jesus Christ, his power, his works were of the devil, that he was of Beelzebub. Okay, you know, uh, making that kind of claim, uh, proclaiming that is the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost and that will not be forgiven you, okay? And so you can see there that there's kind of like two groups, and that's why I believe verse 8 is about the saved, that confess Christ, and uh, Christ will confess them in heaven, and then the unsaved that deny or reject Christ. That's what I think about at this point in time. And then you might say, well, what about believers that don't confess Christ? What about believers that don't make him known? Well, they just won't receive that honor. They just won't receive that praise from Jesus before the angels. Okay. Verse number 10. <clears throat> uh, 11, sorry. And when they bring you into synagogues, into the synagogues, and unto the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. Now you might say, well, hold on, wait, wait a minute. So if I get brought before court, are you saying that I don't have to 
get a lawyer, I don't have to prepare myself, I just have to stand there and speak because the Holy Ghost will uh, give me what to say. It kind of sounds like that way, but one thing you need to realize, keep your finger there, turn to Mark 13. Keep to, go to Mark 13. That this uh, teaching, this doctrine of um, you know, not preparing yourself because the Holy Ghost will speak on your behalf um, is basically an end times doctrine. Okay? This is something to do with the tribulation period. Okay, when the Antichrist, um, you know, uh, reveals himself and lifts himself up to be as God and he starts persecuting the children of God, at that point there'll be believers that are brought before powers and magistrates. It's this time when the Holy Ghost will teach you in the same hour what to say. Look at Mark 13. Mark 13 verse 8. Mark 13 verse 8. It says, For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines and troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. Remember what the beginnings of sorrows is? That's the first three and a half years of the final week of, of Daniel, the last seven year, uh, uh, years before Christ comes back to establish his millennial kingdom. Verse number nine. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall deliver you up to councils, and in the synagogues you shall be beaten, and you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. And the gospel must first be published amongst, among all nations. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand what you shall speak. Neither do ye premeditate. But whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye. For it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Okay? So go back to Luke chapter uh, 12. So please, if for whatever reason, today, if you're brought before courts, yeah, pre prepare a defense. All right? Get a lawyer, do all those kinds of things. Because this teaching is about the end times. This teaching is when, you know, the Antichrist starts persecuting the people of God. All right? Verse number 13. And, and look, that's why it's so important to compare Scripture with Scripture. Right? It's always important to get, you know, the two or three witnesses when you establish a doctrine. Okay? Because, I, I mean, I don't know. I've never been in, in Pentecostal circles. But it wouldn't surprise me if they teach this. Like, if you get brought for a court, don't worry. The Holy Ghost will speak for you. Right? And potentially they're probably getting a worse position than they were when they started. All right, verse number uh, 13. And one of the, and this, I don't know, this was, some, this was a passage that always really confused me as a child. I don't know about you, okay? Uh, uh, verse 13. And one of the companies said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. And he said unto him, Man, who have made me a judge or a divider over you? Have you ever wondered, what is that about? I mean, surely, if there's going to be a judge over anybody, it's going to be Jesus Christ. It's going to be the Lord God. Surely, you know, he has the right to step in and make, you know, righteous judgment, you know. And, uh, and I'm glad because um, if you guys remember my sermon on God-ordained institutions, do you remember that? Where I said that God had established four institutions in the world, you know, one being um, the family, another being the church, another being your workplace or the business, and another being the government. And I spoke about how each authority, each institution has a head, and then there are people that are subject unto that power, unto that head or that ruler, okay? And um, I'm glad I went through that, because now that you understand that, you know, I think what Jesus Christ is doing here is that he is, um, you know, um, uh, putting himself under the right institution. So, you know, Christ came to save sinners. Christ came to establish his mission to get people saved, and to die for our sins, okay? Christ did not come to sort out everybody's family issues, all right? And uh, that's what the father is for. That's what the husband is for. That's what the head of the house is for, to step in and sort out family problems. And I like this about Jesus, because I'm like, you know, if you came to me and you're like, Pastor Kevin, can you sort this out between me and my brother or my sister? I'm like, who made me in charge over you, right? Who made me? I, I'm the pastor of your church. Hey, but if you've got problems, you need to go to the head of your family. You need to um, get him to sort out the issues, right? He's the one that's accountable to uh, God for the family, all right? So I think we see that same thing playing out here, is that even though Jesus can step in, and even though he is the God and the Lord of all, and the creator of all things, you know, even, you know, in, in his manhood, he's, he's obeying, you know, or he's um, giving respect to the institutions and their heads, of those institutions that God has created. All right, but more, more to that, there's a greater teaching to this than just that. 
Verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed, listen, and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of, of the things which he possesseth. So, he, you know, okay, maybe this man has been cheated by his brother somehow. Maybe he's not received the fair share of his, in his, his inheritance. But Jesus says, look, that's the small thing. Don't worry about that. Your life is more than just your possessions and your wealth. You know, if, if you're always desiring what other people have, that's covetousness. So you're going to be beware of covetousness. You're committing sin. It's not good for your spiritual health. You know, our life is more than just the house and the cars and the... And look, that's all nice. You know, we all need the kind of things, when, you know, just to get in through life. But we shouldn't be setting our hearts on our just our earthly possessions. I mean, that's the world. The, the, all the world cares about the unsaved is how much they can get, how much money they can make, right? You know, sending mum to, to go and work and, 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 and earn so much more money, and then the family falling apart, the kids not being raised in homes. You know, why? Because they're seeking the material wealth. They're not seeking uh, to raise a godly family, okay? Verse number 16. And this parable is interesting. And this is why I said you've got to, be, you've got to understand that there are saved and unsaved. Oh, actually, no, not this parable, the next one after this. But look at verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow, bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. So this is a man who's been, who's been blessed. He's, he's had a lot of uh, produce, a lot of uh, fruitfulness, and he's got not enough room to put it all in. Hey, he's got more than he needs. Now look, if you have more than you need, what should we do? We should give it to those that are without, right? We should, hey, is there anyone in church that could have use of these things? Is there, any, is there anyone that's poor and needy that I can help? That's what you should do with your abundance, okay? That's what you should do. But instead, this man says, well, I'll just build greater bands, barns and fill them all up. You know, I'll just give it to myself. And then at verse 19, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine knees, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then those, uh, sorry, then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So what's God saying? Look, you've worked so hard for your material possession. There's going to come a day when you're going to pass on. You're going to die. I'm going to take your soul away today. And all those things that you worked so hard for. You know, God says, who's going to take them? Who's, who's, you know, you're not going to be able to take your material wealth to you in heaven. I mean, think about what you have right now in life. You know, your material wealth, your family. You know, what are you going to take with you to heaven? What could you possibly take to heaven? Your house? Your car? Your job? You know, your, 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 you know, your savings account in the, in the bank? Of course not. But what you can take with you to heaven, obviously, is your own soul and the souls of your family. Okay, that's something you can take. So, you know, when you start thinking about, hey, what's eternal? What's going to last forever? That should give us the right perspective as to what we should be focused on in life. This man died. He focused on the material wealth. He didn't even get to enjoy it. Okay, he, didn't get, he couldn't take it with him to heaven. And um, what a waste. But look at verse 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Okay, so how can we be rich before God as people? Well, first of all, stop laying up treasures for yourself on this earth. Okay, because if you're doing that, if that's your focus, your focus will be away from God and away from the things of God. Okay, number two, what we read about it earlier, confess Jesus before men. That'll make you rich in the sight of God. He's going to bring you before the angels and honor you and speak of you highly. That's another way to be rich before God, right? Confess Jesus Christ. You know, don't be shy. Don't be timid. Whoever you cross paths with, you're going to get the opportunity. Speak to them about Jesus Christ. Speak to them about the great salvation he's given you and that he can give to that person also, okay? Verse 22. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, neither for the body, 
what you shall put on. The life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, uh, which neither have storehouse nor barns, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? Now again, when we read something like this, your first, your first thought might be, I don't know, maybe not, you know, but it would be like, oh, so I, I can just quit work, right? I, can just, I just don't have to work anymore because God's going to make sure that I'm provided for, that he's going to clothe me and that he's going to give me food because it does it to the ravens, it does it to the sparrows. Okay, but obviously, you know, rightly dividing the word of God, you know, um, obviously the first application here are to his disciples, okay, those that had forsaken all, those that, were, that came to sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his preaching, so then they can be the, the, the future leaders of the church after Christ would be resurrected. And so, yeah, you know, the first application for those that had given up all, that had given up their families and their, and their full-time jobs to, to seek after Christ while he was on the earth, yeah, you know, Jesus Christ, as we saw, was able to feed 5,000, you know? He was able to do great miracles. And so, yeah, in that sense, they don't have to worry about those things. As long as they're seeking the kingdom of God, they're making themselves rich before God, using the time wisely to follow after Jesus, then yeah, God would provide their meat and their raiment and so on, okay? But that time has gone. Now, of course, the applications are still there for us. But we know the instructions that God gives us as men to be working, to have a job, to provide for your family. Okay? And of course, it's through those processes, by keeping those commandments that God has given us, that is obviously going to provide the meat and the raiment and the things that we need. All right? So, yeah, don't be that kind of person. And there are people out there that read this and go, well, I'll just quit my job. You know, I just quit my job um, and become a Nazar. Nazar you know, people, people think you know they can become a Nazarite. You know, make a vow to God, grow their hair long like Samson, and you know, God's just going to take care of their every needs. But they, they end up being bums. Is what ends up happening. All right, verse twenty-five. And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? I wish I could do that. I wish I could. I, I loved playing basketball as a as a teenager. I loved it. I loved it. But I was short. Right? I just couldn't really do much being short because usually playing basketball, you've got to be pretty tall. I wish I could do that, right? Uh, but then look at this. This is, this is what he says to me. Verse 26. If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? So look, you cannot change your physical appearance. You cannot make yourself taller. God has made you the way you are. You can't change it. Look, just be satisfied with how you look. Okay, That's how God's made you. Okay, that's how God wants you to look. Okay, that's how tall God wants you to be. All right, good. I read somewhere that shorter people live longer than taller people, by the way. I don't know if that's true. So maybe I'm meant to live longer than some of you guys. <laughs> maybe there's something good out of that. But look, uh, the, the idea here is, look, um, the things you can't change, the things you can't, um, uh, you know, think about and something, you know, it's just going to miraculously change. Don't worry about those things, okay? That's not what you should be considered, considering about, you know? And a lot of ladies, you know, worry about their looks a lot, you know? Uh, wanting to make sure that they look as attractive as possible. Look, that shouldn't be the, the priority of a, of a lady, okay? That shouldn't be... You can't change it, okay? But there are things that you can work toward. And of course, that's being rich toward God, okay? No matter how much makeup you put in your face, that's not going to add treasures in heaven, Okay, you can't, don't worry about that. That's, that's, that's got little value. There's nothing you can change about that. Focus on what you can do for the Lord. And verse 20, 20, uh, 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So even Solomon who had everything, he basically says, I had everything that I can possibly have. And Jesus says, look, even the lilies, the little, the flowers, they, they're more beautiful than what even Solomon could achieve in his life. Verse 28, if then God so clothe the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe ye, ye, uh, you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat and what ye shall drink, neither be ye, doubtful, uh, be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. Hey, that's what those that are unsaved, that do not have me, that do not have God as their father, that's what they seek after. And it says, and your father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Okay, God already knows we need the things that we need just to get through life. Okay? 
It's the unbelievers that are worried and thoughtful about material possessions and needs. We should not be like the unbelievers, right? We should be thoughtful about the kingdom of God, about being rich before God. Verse 31, But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. And of course, what does that mean? Of course, we know about the coming kingdom of Christ, ruling and reigning with him for a thousand years, and the new heavens and the new earth. Yes, seek that. Okay, have eternity as your mind. But we also know that the, we, we can, we can uh, bring people into the kingdom of God today. Okay, soul winning, preaching the gospel. That is taking thought of the kingdom of God, adding people to that kingdom. That's making you uh, rich before God. Because look at verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Okay, so this is another way we can be rich toward God is to prioritize the kingdom of God and he'll ensure that you have your every need. Okay? Your, your priority ought to be the kingdom of God. You know, if you're a homeschooling mother, when you teach your, ki- your children, yes, you're teaching them academics, but if your mindset is the kingdom of God, you're going to make sure that what they're learning, you know, is profitable for them, right? That they, they, they would grow and learn, and if there's something that's ungodly, if there's something that, that may be a false gospel in some of these Christian curriculums, you know, you just rip that page out. You make sure that there's no corruption because you've got the kingdom of God set in your mind first. There's, there's everything we can do, you know, going to work and, and, and working for the boss and just reminding yourself, hey, I'm here, I'm serving Christ. You know, when you do that, you, you've got your mindset now in the kingdom of God. You've got your mind on the king. You're serving the king. You know, when I come and, and I preach, yeah, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the brethren. I'm coming to minister and serve the brethren. But at the same time, I've got a fear of God. I'm thinking of the kingdom of God. And I want to make sure that what I preach is, is, is as sound and correct as, as I possibly can. Okay? Just having the kingdom of God as your, your mindset, first and foremost, can change the way you do everything in your life. Any little thing in your life. Verse 33. Sell that ye have and give alms. So do good works and give to the poor. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old. So Jesus says, look, get a bag that doesn't wear out. Hey, are you going to find one of those on the earth? No. Because look at this. A treasure in the heavens that fail, faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Okay, so another way you can be rich toward God, obviously, is lay up treasure in heaven. You know, whatever you gain in heaven will never be lost. Okay? I mean, you can, you can put money into the, what do they call it? The stock exchange, isn't that what they call it? You know, buy shares of businesses, and just like that, you can lose it all. Okay? But if you invest in heaven, it's there forever. It's yours forever. Praise God. No thief can come and take it from you. There'll be no corruption of the treasures. You know, basically Jesus says, look, get a bag. You know, that doesn't wax old. You know, fill your, your, your heavenly bag, your eternal bag with the treasures of heaven. And it says that's where your heart will be also. So think about this. This is a good test of knowing whether you are, you are working to, um, tr- uh, uh, to build treasures in heaven or not. Is where is your heart? Okay? Where is your heart? Think about it. Think about what do you wake up? What are the first things that you think about when you wake up? You know, is it Facebook? You know? I've, I've talked about that before, right? But if it is, that's where your heart is, okay? What is, what, you know, the things that I spend hours and hours and hours doing, you know, the, the, the hobbies and the activities that I do, you know, if, if you're, sp- like, spending hours and that's where your mind is constantly, that's where your heart is. That's where your heart is. That's the treasures that you're building towards, okay? But if you can honestly say, no, you know what, the first thing in my mind is to read my Bible. The first thing, you know, as I go throughout the day is to pray continually and, and I'm seeking the Lord to change my life and to be more like Christ. If you can truly say that, then you are truly, you know, uh, putting treasures in heaven. You are laying up your treasures in heaven. So that's a good test for yourselves, you know, is, you know, and, and look, you know, there are other things that will distract you, other things that you need to do in life, of course. But what is your primary, what are your primary desires and your primary love of your heart? That's where you know, where you're laying up treasures, okay? Verse 35. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning, and ye yourselves like unto men that wait for the Lord, 
when he will return from the wedding, uh, that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself and make them to sit down to meet and will come forth and serve them. This is another way you can be rich toward God is to watch for the second coming of Christ. Okay, to, to, to pay attention to the events that are unfolding in this world, to know what the Bible says about the end times, so you can be watching and waiting for the Lord to come. That's another way to be rich before God. And God says there in verse, uh, Jesus says in verse 37, that if he finds you watching, that when you come before him, he's going to come, sit you down, give you food, and serve you. Okay, that's what we, when we sang that hymn, you know, brethren, we have come to worship. And he says that Christ will come and gird himself and serve us with sweet manner all around. That's another amazing honor. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but if I'm at that table and Jesus Christ comes and serves me, you know, I, I'll be like, oh, a bit of shame. I'll be like, like John the Baptist was, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not, I shouldn't be baptizing you, you should be baptizing me. Or like, like, uh, like, um, Peter, you know, God, Lord, you, you never wash my feet. Like, I'd probably feel a little bit like that. But thank God we're going to have our righteous bodies by then, you know, without the sin and without the shame. So it might be a bit of a different, um, thing, but what a beautiful thing, what a loving thing that Jesus, even though he's the God of the universe, the creator of all things, will honor you if you if he finds you watching for his coming, will honor you, sit you down, feed you, and 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 serve you. What an amazing, amazing uh honor. So that's another way you can be rich toward God. Now verse 38. And if you shall come in the second watch or in the come in the third watch and find them so, blessed are those servants. By the way, that second watch and that third watch, the idea there is like during the night, um, you know, obviously like in the cities back in these days, you'd have watchmen watching for enemies. And so you'd have like a, a second watch or a third watch. You know, you have a rotation of guards basically that would come and watch the night, make sure there's no enemies. That's what, what it's kind of saying is that we should be like those guards, you know, just watching out, making sure, um, you know, waiting for the Lord to return. And then it says in verse 39, um, and this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and have not suffered his house to be broken through. Be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. Now let me say this. Verse 40, let, let's read that carefully. Because if you don't read this carefully, this is a verse that probably the pre-trib believers will use, okay? It'll be like, see? Let's read the second part there. For the Son of Man cometh at an hour when you think not. You know, Jesus can come back at any moment. He can come back right now. You know, in five minutes after the service, whenever. You know, it's imminent. He might come right now. And they'll read that bit. But they'll forget the first bit. <laughs> Be ye therefore ready also. Right? What does that mean? Also. What do you mean? Verse 39. Let's go back to verse 39. For this know that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and have not suffered or allowed his house to be broken through. Okay, so we can know in this parable, we can know when the thief is coming. Okay, if we're watching, all right? So it's not going to come at every, any moment, any, 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 any second. You know, we don't know it's going to be before. No, we know because we're watching, we're reading the Bible. We know what, the, what God has given us about the end times, the knowledge that it's before, uh, sorry, after the tribulation, but before God pours out his wrath, we're going to be able to see the signs. We're going to be able to see the Antichrist raising. Look, we're watching. We're going to be paying attention to these things. And in that case, you know, in this parable, we're not going to be like that person that has a thief that just comes through uh, without us knowing. Of course we know. Be ye therefore ready also. Okay? We know. We know when it's going to happen. As long as we're watching. Now, some people have said this, that, you know, um, actually, I think most pre-treavers, most pre trib teachers say, Jesus never taught on the rapture. Don't you know this is about his return to establish his kingdom? This is for the Jews, just like they say about Matthew 24. That's for the Jews. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, please. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 16. First Thessalonians chapter 4. Of course, the, the, the most famous chapter on the rapture. Okay, pre-trib, post-trib, no trip, I don't know. We all believe this is about the rapture, this is about the resurrection. Look at verse uh, 16. 
For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So just to start there, we see this is definitely about the rapture. Okay, definitely about the resurrection, being caught up into the clouds with Jesus Christ. But we need to keep reading. Chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. Paul says, look, now I'm going to give you the timing. I'm going to give you the seasons. But I don't have to write this unto you, he says. Look, right? He says, look, I have no need to write. Why? Why does he have no need to write this unto, unto, um, unto you? Verse number two. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. What did we read in Luke chapter 12? Jesus teaching about his coming. Jesus teaching about it being like the thief in the night. And to watch. So look, Paul says, look, I don't need to write to you about the rapture because you already know. You already know. Why do they know? It's because Jesus already taught them. Jesus already taught on the rapture. Already taught his coming. You know, this, these verses confirms to us that what we read in Luke 12 is some knowledge that was already had, okay? And that Jesus had already taught them, and you can already see it's the same, it's the same information there. It's about the thief coming in the night. Verse number three, uh, in First Thessalonians 1, uh, 5, First Thessalonians 5, verse 3, For when they shall say peace and safety, then, cometh, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that, day, that that day should overtake you as a thief. That confirms it also, right? Because Jesus says, be ye also ready. So you can watch. You know when the thief is coming. And, and uh, Paul is saying, look, you're of the light. You know, you're not going to be the kind of person where the day overtakes you as a thief. Because you should be watching. Verse number five. Ye are all children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. The same instructions that Paul has given, okay, on the most famous rapture passage, the same illustration of the thief in the night, the same instruction to watch is what Jesus taught us in Luke chapter 12, okay? Luke chapter 12 is the rapture. It's for the Thessalonians, the believers, as much as it is to the saved Jews, all right? It's to everyone, all right? It's to everyone. And obviously, to those that are watching, we're going to know, and those that are in the darkness, they're not going to know, and it's going to be like a thief coming into the house, okay? So, Jesus, it's the same instructions that were given to the church. Go back to Luke chapter 12, verse 41. Luke chapter 12, verse 41. And uh, this, this question is quite important. Then Peter said unto him, Lord, speaketh thou this parable unto us, or even to all? Okay? So remember, the great multitude saved, unsaved, all kinds of people. You know, Peter says, is this for us or is this for everybody? And uh, Jesus, so I mean, that basically confirms that, you know, there's other groups of people there. And um, Jesus doesn't really answer that, like, directly. He gives another parable, okay? And please, before we read this parable, understand it's a parable, okay? It's a story, it's an illustration of something. Because this is where people really mess it up. And I said, like, some so-called Christians think, you know, believers can be cast into the lake of fire, even if it's just a temporal thing. But verse 42, And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his Lord shall make ruler of his household, to give them their portion of meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Of a truth I say unto you, that he will make him ruler over all that he hath. So we know now what we just read here is about believers, people that are watching for the Lord, right? That he's going to, um, you know, make that, that uh, the, his servants a ruler over the household if he finds them watching, all right, and, and ready for the Lord's return. But look at verse 45. And if that servant say in his heart, my Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to beat the men servants and maidens, and to eat and drink and to be drunken, the Lord of that servant will come in a day when he looketh not for him, and at an hour when he is not aware, and will cut him in sunder, 
and will appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. So you can see, if you're reading this thinking, hold on, this must be about a saved person, why will his portion be with the unbelievers? Um, and uh, so, you know, that's where people get the idea that, you know, um, <clears throat> uh, Christians might go to hell or might go to the lake of fire or anything like that. But remember, this is a parable, okay? This is a story about a Lord and servants, okay? This isn't about necessarily, you know, the, the parable is not about Christ being necessarily your Lord, okay? But of course, the Lord is the Lord of all things anyway, okay? I mean, every tongue will confess that Jesus is the Lord. Anyway, whether you're saved or unsaved, you know, whether your, your, your eternal destiny is in hell, at some point, you're going to realize that Jesus Christ was the Lord, okay? So we need to understand if we, we know the scriptures, we know we can never lose our salvation, we, can, we know that it's eternal life, we have the foundations in place, then we can approach a parable like this and make sense of it. Because obviously, it's about an unbeliever. Obviously, it's about someone that mocks and says, well, you know, you said that the Lord is coming, but he's not coming back, and he, and he, and he just uh, decides to, you know, live it up, he doesn't believe in the Bible. This is someone that's unsaved, okay? And we know this because we have the foundations of other key doctrines right. And it's, it's when people take these passages and really mess them up, that just tells you they haven't even got their foundations right. They're not even established, you know, um, you know um, they're not even established in the first place. They might not even be saved, those that teach, you know, ridiculous things like this. But look, let's keep reading, verse 47. And that servant which knew the Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did commit things worthy of stripes, shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto, sorry, for unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall, uh, uh, of him shall be much required, and to whom men have committed much, of him they will ask the more. Okay, let's think about this now. Okay, God is saying basically, those that knew that he was coming, those that had the information, okay, they've heard scriptures, they've not believed on Jesus Christ, they're going to be beaten with many stripes. But then there are others that did not necessarily know, okay, but still they're unsaved. They're going to be beaten with few stripes. They're still going to be punished, but with fewer stripes than the one that knew more, okay, and still rejected that truth. And what we take out of this is that hell is not equal punishment for all. Okay, and we, we, we've, we've covered this before in the past. Remember when, when Jesus said that, um, you know, it would be more tolerable for, you know, one to you, was it Beth, 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 Bethsaida? You know, it would be more tolerable that, to you than for Sodom. You know, those kinds of things, those kinds of things that we read about in a few chapters ago, is the same idea. There are, you know, and, and about those cities, it was because Jesus Christ had come into the cities and done amazing works and amazing miracles, and the people had rejected him. And it's those that had the chance to see Christ that their punishment was going to be worse. Okay? And the idea here is those that know the scriptures, those that had the opportunity to hear the gospel, those that have heard, you know, grown up in a Christian home or whatever, and they still reject Christ, their punishment, their stripes will be many, you know, compared to those that really didn't get much of an opportunity to know about Christ and rejected him. They're going to be punished as well, but with fewer stripes. So I hope that makes sense there, um, what that is about. And then look at verse 49. I am come to send fire on the earth, and what will I if it be already kindled? That's an interesting one. I thought this might have been about hellfire, but it's, it's sort of fire on the earth. And I think if we continue reading, it makes sense. I think what this is talking about is that uh, the fire that Jesus is referring to here is that Jesus Christ is, going, is bringing division. Okay? His presence, his mission will bring division in the earth. Okay? We'll look at this, verse 50. But I have a baptism to be baptized with. And let's, let's stop there. So what's baptism? It's basically, it's immersion. Okay? This is not water baptism. We know Jesus was already water baptized. Okay? But we know that there is a baptism that Jesus will be baptized with. That's being immersed. You know, that, that would be the grave. You know, being uh, buried in the grave. You know, or his soul being in hell. That is also being immersed. Okay? 
So we, we know what Jesus Christ is talking about here. That's, he's got a, a death that, that's, that, that he's approaching to. And then he says, and how am I straightened till it be, sorry, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? And we know that word straight, S-T-R-A-I-T, is like narrow, okay? So it's kind of like, and how am I sort of like narrowly, like, like focused till it be accomplished? Now Jesus says, look, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm focused to accomplish the task that God has given me to be baptized, you know, that, that baptism's come to, to go uh, through death, you know. And he says, like, nothing will stop him following through with this, okay. But then look at verse 51. Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth, I tell you nay, but rather division. Say, well, hold on, it's Christmas. Isn't this is when we talk about peace on earth because Christ has come? Yeah, you know, Christ has come to give us peace with God. Okay, with God the Father, we would be right with Him. That's what the peace is. But you know it. You know this already. When you receive Christ as Savior, okay, when you when you strive to walk with the Lord for the Lord, this, it's going to bring division. You're going to have people that say, "What's wrong with you? Why are you doing this? Why are you living like this? Why are you raising your children like that?" And it's going to cause division amongst your friends and your family. That's the division that Jesus is speaking about here. Okay, verse fifty-two. For from henceforth. There shall be five in one household divided, three against two and two against three. And that's the saddest thing. When your close family, in your own house, someone gets saved and they reject you. And there's division or whatever. And that happens to a lot of people. It's such a sad thing. You know, verse 53, the father shall be divided against the son and the son against the father, the mother against the daughter and the daughter against the mother, the mother-in-law against the daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. Look, the gospel brings division. Okay, and you know, I, I know uh, it's sad. You know, I thank God I've grown up in a Christian home, Christian parents. You know, thank God. You know, thank God. But some of you guys have not had that. And you got saved, and, and your family reject you. There's divisions, there's arguments, there's debates, and I feel I feel sad for you. I feel sad for you. But look, Jesus prophesied. He told us. You know, we can't be like, well, God, why is this happening? Jesus told us already that it was going to happen. Okay, that His good news, that His message was going to cause divisions in the family, okay? The more you strive to, to live biblically, the more your unsaved family and friends will detest you. Verse 54, And he said also to the people, When you see a cloud rise out of the west, stri- straightway you say, There cometh a shower, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, There will be heat, and it cometh to pass. So this is, you know, forecasting the weather. You know, we're pretty good at forecasting the weather, you know, even today. Verse 56, ye hypocrites, and remember, we started with the hypocrites at the beginning of this chapter. Ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it that ye do not discern this time? So we know what the hypocrisy is about because it's the leaven of the Pharisees, okay? The ones that were rejecting Christ. It says, look, you're a hypocrite. You can determine the weather, you can figure out science, but here I am, here am I doing amazing works before you, here am I offering you salvation, giving you healing, you know, giving you the, the great wise words that come from the scriptures, and you don't even, you can't even discern this time. You don't even know that the Messiah is here. You don't know the Son of God is here and that He's coming to die and to, to redeem mankind back to God. That's the hypocrisy of them. And this is the same hypocrisy of the atheists. You go and knock on the atheist door and say, oh, I don't believe the Bible. What do you believe? I believe in science. You're a hypocrite. Because if you knew science, if you knew you know, the, 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 the laws of the universe, you can't help but believe in God. You can't help but believe there's a creator. Okay? Atheists, those that believe in so-called science or science-ly, science falsely so-called, they are hypocrites. They've eaten the leaven of the Pharisees. Okay? They think you know, they can uh, discern the, tire, the seasons, the science, but reject Jesus Christ. Hey, look, if, if you can do that, if you know the science, if you know the, the, the way the world works, you know there's a God, you know there's a creator, you know, and Jesus is saying, look, all the amazing things that I'm doing, you should know this. You know, what a hypocrite you are. 50, verse 57. Yea, and why even of yourselves judge ye not what is right? When thou goest with, with thine adversary to the magistrate, as thou art in the way, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him, lest he hail thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and the officer cast thee into prison. Um, 
So this is sort of another parable, okay, that's applicable uh, to, to these hypocrites, those that weren't discerning the time, that weren't believing on Jesus Christ. And he gives a story, look, <clears throat> you know, if, if you're going to be brought before court, it's better, you know, give diligence that thou mayest be delivered from him. It's better that you try to sort things out outside of court. It's better to try to sort things out before you get to that level, to that point. Because if you get before, before, before the court, the judge might then just cast you into prison. And at that point, you can't fix things, okay? You're, you're prevented from being able to fix things and making things right. And then verse 59, I tell thee that uh, thou shalt not depart thence till thou hast paid the very last might. Okay, so the idea there is get right with God now or it will be worse for you later on. That's the message to the Pharisees, the hypocrites, those that can't work out that Christ is the Messiah, is the Son of God. Look, sort it out now before you get brought before the judgment of God, the great white front judgment. At that point, you're going to be cast into the prison and you're going to pay for it all. You know what that means. You're going to be cast into hell and you're going to pay for your sins for all eternity. There's nothing you can do to fix it. Now's the time to fix it before God. Now's the time to get right before God. That's instruction that Jesus Christ has given to the unsaved. So, you, can, you know, we wrapped it up there. I hope that's given you a good um, idea of this chapter. But the main thing I want you guys to be thinking about is how can I become rich, right? <laughs> Put your hands on the TV screen right now. No, no. How can I become rich before God? How can I lay up treasures in heaven forever? That's what your heart should be. That's what your heart should be, right? I don't want you get to get into heaven and you're poor and you're like, well, Pastor Kevin never preached about how to get rich in heaven. All right, it's all in the Bible. It's all there. All right, preach the gospel, confess the Lord, lay up treasures in heaven. You know, seek first the kingdom of God. You know, don't, don't seek, you know, the possessions and the wealth of this life. And at the same time, be watchful, waiting for the Lord. Okay, know what the scriptures say about Jesus Christ coming. You know, don't, don't just throw things out. Oh, that's for the Jews. No, it's for you. You know, it's for you. And, we, we, you know, the, God has given us enough scriptures to be able to piece together, you know, the timing of, of his coming. It's such an exciting thing. And then if you've done that, if you're rich before God, he's going to come and serve you. He's going to come and give you sweet manna in heaven, you know, give you food. What an amazing thing. All right, let's pray.